When hundreds of protesters took to the streets demanding government action against illegal and unethical mining, 54 of them ended up in police and prison custody. Their nearly three-week detention sparked public outrage and debate, almost eclipsing the original cause of their process. Even after they were granted bail, one prominent protester remained behind bars, reportedly facing physical abuse from the police. In this episode of Hot Issues, we hear his side of the story for the first time since regaining his freedom. I am Kemeni Amano, and today I sit with a man considered one of the masterminds behind a three-day Stop Galamsey Now protest. While incarcerated, he drew attention to the inhumane conditions inside police cells. My guest is Oliver Barker Vomo, constitutional rights and policy strategy advisor at Democracy Hub. Oliver, you're welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you. Appreciate it. Democracy Hub went out to protest illegal and unethical mining, resulted in 54 of you being arrested. What happened? Okay, we're going for the jugglery. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it, it's something which I'm still reflecting. Um, it's, it's, I think in many re respects, uh, trying to make sense of some of the incidents that have happened would take a, a while for us to be able to fully unpack. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a process that we as a nation must be willing to, to go through. Even for us at Democracy Hub, one of the things that we're going to be doing is petitioning Parliament for an inquiry to be conducted into the way in which the police conducted or misconducted themselves vis-a-vis -vis young people who came up wanting to believe in our democracy. But the big thing is that one of the things that we have been saying consistently is that we have to be able to mobilize as many of civic individuals, civic-minded individuals, to be able to add a push Mm -hmm. to some of the big questions that are facing our democracy. There's none more urgent we consider today than the crisis of, of the environment, which has been provoked by responsible and illegal mining across the, uh, across the rural, rural landscape of Ghana. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what we wanted to have a conversation on and draw the nation's attention on. Right. But mixed into that, there are also bigger convers other conversations. One, since last year's Occupy Jolobi House, Democracy Up! Face the Country have received at least six successive injunctions that have been placed on any attempt to protest. So it's a bigger question about the freedom of assembly and the ways in which the courts have been instrumentalized in order to cut that down or mm. to, to restrict the scope for persons being able to, to, to protest. And we saw that happen again prior to this protest that the police, even though they had been notified three months to the event, rushed to the courts a few days before the, the protest and came out saying that, ah, again waving in the air, uh, an ex parte injunction that they supposedly obtained. Mm -hmm. Now, our position was clear. Even if, the, in fact, a legal ex parte injunction had been obtained, we we're going to defy it. Because we wanted Ghanaians to pay attention to the ways in which, insidiously, the courts were being used to disarticulate constitutional rights. That's a big problem for us. But that's not even what happened. They went to court and obtained an ex parte injunction, which is unconstitutional to begin with, and unconstitutional orders must, must not even be respected. What, what, I mean, why do you think that what the police did prior to the protest was yeah. unconstitutional? So the, the courts have been clear that when you have been notified of a protest and you disagree as to whether or not the protest should go on, you both come before a judge. And then I explain to the judge why this protest is important and must happen on this date. And then you tell the courts why you are not able to be able to ensure that the protest goes on. And the judge makes the decision in the interest of our democracy. But that's not what they, they did, and that's not what they've been doing consistently. They go to court, ex parte, meaning that without notice to us, and then go and inform a judge that for X, Y, these reasons, it is urgent, give us an order to stop them. And the courts have been clear that you cannot continue to do that, because that's the past we're trying to get away from. And, and, and in 1994, when the MPP went to, court, to, the, to, to mm. the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said clearly, one of the ways in which our rights have been suppressed is this manner in which the police behave as if we live in a police state. And that the, it, it transformed itself into we need permission. And that we don't want a permit, per, permission regime. Right. We want a notification. You just tell the police and you go ahead. Mm. The explanation the police had provided the public in mm. one of their statements was that they were embarking on a three-day a, a three special operation. In fact, that only came on uh, the night before the event. That's right. So consistently, 
Well, they first obtained the injunction. We were clear that this is illegal. And they knew it was unconstitutional. And then they issued an understatement to the public that, oh, don't worry, the protest is going to go ahead and everything is fine. We're going to provide security. Then the day prior, they invited us to a meeting where they said, we are not going to allow you to do it. But if you want to do it, here are six obscure locations. Go and be there instead. And we said, we wanted to understand your reasons for how you came up with those locations. They said, security traffic, things mm -hmm. like that. So we also went retreated and said, okay, we're happy to provide you six alternative locations that meets the criteria that you have proposed. They said they were going to confer and get back to us. Later they got back and said, no, they're not going to allow uh, that. So we understood that it had broken. We, we mm -hmm. couldn't reach an agreement. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go back to what has already been notified to you three months prior. Then in the ninth prior, they come up and say, we're holding special operations in Accra and we're shutting down the entirety of the city. You think it was a ploy? And that's the, you see, the, for me, that's the bigger question in which, we are, which is being left unsaid. The idea that the entirety of this country, and particularly residents of Accra, can accept unexplained special operations for three days, which coincid coincidentally just coincides with when we are doing the protest. But the idea that you can reserve for yourself the power to lock down Accra, a short notice, without any explanation, without anybody calling you to order, without you feeling the need to justify to us, that in itself shows us the insidious nature in which police power is being exercised mm -hmm. to undermine our democracy. That's the conversation that we need to have in its, in its entirety. Right. Now, that conversation must be had, and that's one of the reasons why we think a parliamentary inquiry is important. Mm. But as far as we are concerned, whether or not you have decided for yourself at the last minute to organize whatever special operations, we need to have a conversation in the way in which the special operations can happen and constitutional rights to protest can also happen at the same time. That was not done. In fact, we called the police and I, I called the Accra Regional uh, Commander. Right. I called their lawyer as well and said, we need to have a framework in which protests can go on and can go on safely. They said they have orders of above not to engage us. So we understood clearly going out that this was going to happen. When did this meeting occur? The, so the, the meeting we had was... Uh, so we had the event on the Friday. So the meeting we had with them regarding the locations was on Thursday. Mm. On Friday morning, I had a call. I had a call with them on the phone regarding, again, let us, you have announced special operations. We don't know what that means. How does it impact and affect mm -hmm. our protest? Again, refusal to engage. So we told ourselves that the bigger point we want to be able to emphasize is that constitutional rights must always be respected, but force must be justified. We are not seeing that happen. But it is important for tomorrow that we don't resile in our, in, our, in, in our duty to ensure that these rights are respected. So we're going to go out and we're going to step out. Mm. And so when we got, we got to the 37 runabout, we saw that they had set up and closed everywhere else. But what they hadn't done was to stop motorists from coming in there while protesters were there. In fact, consistently we engaged them. And there's so many videos of them online that the traffic is going to affect protesters. People are likely going to lose their lives because it's, uh, it, I mean, cars are moving. Mm -hmm. So can you block it at Kaukudi so that we can redirect them? They refuse to engage. You, again, you see that and media folks were following me anytime I engage the police. Again, can you do this in 30 minutes because this is becoming more and more. In fact, they brought people to be ushering the traffic because they thought that that's the way in which they can disrupt the protest. And so we decided that the safety of the protesters, which the police were supposed to ensure, which they were not doing, was going to be our responsibility. And so then we started redirecting the traffic. So that's why you blocked the road. So that's why the road was stopped, to be able to protect protesters, in order to redirect traffic. But even in that, if there was any vehicle, which was a, an ambulance, which was anybody with a medical condition, we allowed them through. This was consistent with what we did at last year's Occupy right. Jolobi so, so, so then the, the video that circulated with some of the protesters blocking a vehicle that was in an emergent situation from going through because they said they had to go to 37 military hospital, you wouldn't let them go through? Absolutely not. In fact, what happened was that... That is not the case? So that is not the case. So the police had blocked the way to 37. The only way to get there was to use the back. And what they were doing was that even if it was an emergency situation... Unless it is an ambulance, they wouldn't allow. If it was not an ambulance, we would then intercede and plead with them. They still wouldn't allow, so the people had to use the back gate. But to use the back, it means that you have to go into oncoming traffic. So we have to stop oncoming traffic to allow people to be able to pass and go. This is what we did consistently. So the protesters didn't block anybody the, from getting the, emergent the care? No single individual who needed emergency care was blocked from doing that. Now... The police had blocked down half of Accra. Invariably, 
the city does this was a lock jam traffic because they had blocked principal roads that were access roads to so many people that's not something we could have prevented or do anything about you understand okay. what they had failed to do was even to provide the public with alternative routes and how to be able to assess critical services none of that has happened and in fact nobody is questioning them on what are the alternative routes you set out when you announce those special operations because it was a half measure it was never thought through and the intention was to be able to block constitutional rights from happening mm. in a way that suggests as if there was a security imperative what was the interaction or engagement with the police when you know the protesters are taking it onto themselves to block that part of the road for their own safety so i mean we had had the prime interactions with them okay. in fact when we started redirecting the traffic what would happen is that there might be a police vehicle or that there must be a, not even a police vehicle a police officer or a military officer in mufti who may have a, a sticker indicating that there are any of the security services those vehicles they wanted those individuals to pass and we said no every individual must then be redirected because we're not going to be able to create a situation whereby ordinary civilians would be affected by the redirection but then you want to then create favors for persons who are affiliated to you mm -hmm. that we didn't allow and that i can say categorically we didn't allow that to happen because we wanted to be fair to everybody else now consistently throughout this conversation there was not a moment where we stopped engaging the police and asked them to redirect eventually on the second day they did that by blocking the traffic at the airport square from those who were coming on towards the liberation road that's what we know they did right so when when you say eventually second day they did that they yeah. did what you did on the first day yes so the second day that's what they had set up but mind you when we're going into the second day they had issued another statement which was clear that they are saying clearly that we're going to arrest anybody that shows up on that day but our position has always been clear as long as we're exercising constitutional rights you can use force and justifiably but we will show up that we will not i mean we understood the risk of it but it's not for our sake that we are stepping out we are, it's a bigger message and so that we're not intimidated in exercise of rights now on the second day even when they issued that statement i'm telling you i personally called the lawyer and i called the regional command and i said this, what we are reading from the statement we don't like let us have a dialogue as to how we can de-escalate the conversation response? again the conversation is that we have been authorized not to engage so we are clear that it was not something that happened accidentally they they wanted to do what they did and they did it anyway mm. it's the same thing that happened last year as well that they swooped everybody out including journalists and arrested everybody and even kept denying that they had done that so videos came out is it right to say that perhaps the lack of agreement between the police and democracy hub from from the very beginning mm -hmm. is what had you know created fertile grounds for what occurred on, on the day that you know the processes were arrested so this is one of the things that is important when when civilians and law enforcement agencies meet and interact we ought to remember that only one of those groups have been trained at taxpayers expense law enforcement we paid for their training mm -hmm. we expect that they have the understanding to always be interested in a conversation about de-escalation when you're dealing with crowds no that responsibility we took it upon ourselves because the safety of protesters has always been our, our concern and chief pride mm -hmm. now as far as they are concerned their language and disposition institutionally and everybody knows this even when the police stop you and ask why have i been stopped it means that you have disrespected them and so they must brutalize you we know the colonial origins of the police force as we have it. And so when we are dealing with them, we are very methodic in the ways in which we deal with them and even speak to them. But for some reason, just because when they say, don't do it, and he said, no, we can't, it, that's not how it works in a democracy, that infuriates them. But we have always made sure that we must hold the line. Just because they say they don't agree, doesn't mean that's the last word. Right. That we must, but what does the law say? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And even for us, there's a reason why consistently, even though the law says notify the police for five, with five days prior, we notify them three months prior. Mm -hmm. Because we are expecting consistent engagement. We are expecting that they disagree. I mean, as far as democracy up the country is concerned, the attitude is that no matter what happens, we are not going to allow them to protest. I mean, but you know, you sound a little bit, bit as though the police do not want you to protest. Absolutely think so. I'm saying that, remember the last protest we had? was last year occupied Jolobi. We did that defying another court order. Do you understand? But, Consistently, but why, why will the police from the very first, the very first face the country protest, they obtained an ex injunction. On that occasion, 
Even the Attorney General said we should defy it because it was unconstitutional. We said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to challenge it all the way to the Supreme Court. And that's what we did. We're supposed to do that on May 9th, 2020, uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. We ended up protesting in August after Macho Kaka and others had been killed in Nigeria. So the disposition of the, of the regime, for whatever thing, is that when young people gather to be, they, they are not seen as participants in our democracy. They are not seen as persons who are bearers of, of, of policy concerns that our democracy should also be able to take up and solve. Is that these people, uh, they are a threat to our regime and our sustenance. And, and the police, you know, statement indicated that some of these young people were engaged in untoward behavior. I mean, in, in fact, think about it. When we first tried to do a protest, ministers were in parliament saying that we had been hijacked by terrorists that we are operating with a coup d'etat mentality. It has never left us. I'm standing trial on the same charges. But consistently, we have, we have emphasized the point right. that the right and the freedom of protest belongs to every Ghanaian, young or old, and particularly young people. We are a young democracy. Mm -hmm. In fact, young people make up the majority of our electoral uh, population and even of our society. I, I, I want to look at some of the charges that you are facing. Okay. Conspiracy to commit unlawful assembly. Unlawful assembly causing unlawful damage, offensive conduct, offensive conduct conducive to the breach of peace, assault on the public officer, defacement of public notice, and stealing. Let's talk about the last one. Okay. The last one. Okay. Why did you take the key from the police ignition? Oh, is that, the, is, the vehicle? Is that what the stealing charge is on? Because I haven't, I haven't quite reached there yet. But uh, I have been very clear. You see, one of the things which I, whenever we set out to do anything, we are doing so to be able to show Ghanaians the full scope of their constitutional mm -hmm. and rights in this country. One of the most important things our courts have held, as far back as 1974, when a police unlawfully tries to arrest you, you can beat up the police officer. In fact, somebody did, Asante did. And the court said, yes, that's what you're supposed to do. Nobody is entitled to, take away, to restrict you or take away your rights illegally. And this is another moment of that, where the police try to seize property, private property, illegally. And anybody who tries to steal, to seize private property illegally, is entitled to be resisted. This is that resistance that we're showing there. What, what we In saw. that moment, we were standing, we had brought a truck which contained medicine, food, and water, and placards for protesters. It had been parked under the trees that was at it, near the Trotro station. Not even on, on the road. It was been stopped there, the driver was out, things like that. Then we saw police officers forming uh, a wall around the vehicle. My understanding, initial, initially, I had assumed that they were trying to prevent the vehicle from moving onto the street. Mm -hmm. So I just came and told the driver, there was a laptop which was exposed. Take the laptop, raise the windows and close it and go. So that, I mean, they make, it is clear to them that this vehicle wasn't going anywhere. So we're standing there when we saw them bring a tow truck and immediately proceeded to tow the truck. Our initial instinct in that moment was to prevent it. So we stood in front of it as individuals in a way in which somebody, an environmental protester, might chain themselves to a tree in the hope that the tree is saved. So we were, you know, putting our bodies on the line to protect it. Obviously, it meant nothing to them. And we started seeing the tow truck get into under our legs. And the video supports this. And so even one of the guys fell on the tow, on the tow truck. I see. And I left, and I, so I walked from it. So I started walking around the tow truck to see, is there a way in which you can demobilize this truck in fear that it might injure the individuals who were there? So it's, I, I went around it. I couldn't see how. Then I got to the, where the driver was supposed to be. There was no driver in. Immediately, I mean, I am even thinking, but this is so in security incompetent to be able to leave a vehicle running in this scenario. So my first instinct is that I, I, I turn it off so that it stops. Now, when I did, I, I had the key, and I anticipated that they were going to rush me for the key. And so I ran towards the other side where the other police officers were and threw the key to them. Because my interest in that moment... You threw it to the police officers. The key was thrown to the police officers on the other side. In fact, they retrieved it in less than five minutes. I see, but it was quite a run before, yeah, well, before you did that. Well, well, I ran from where the incident was to where the other police officers were. Yeah, and, 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 the key and to during them. this period, yeah. uh, it would appear that one of the commanders kept insisting that... Arrest, uh, arrest him. him. Arrest him. And nobody... Yeah. Why do you think that none of the officers, you know, moved I mean, on to arrest you? It, it, it's, it, it's difficult for me to speculate. And my hope is that most of them recognize the, the unlawfulness of the order in that moment. I don't know. That's my, that's my guess. But for, some, for several reasons, none of them wanted to move in that moment. I see. Then subsequently, uh, 
Well, then there was the statement that they couldn't find you. That apparently there was a manhunt uh, for me. Well, and I <laughs> we'll talk about that manhunt. Yes. But reflecting on the incident, yeah. do you think it was a reckless thing you did? I think that it is reckless to deny citizens of their rights. I, I will do it today and I will do it ever consistently. And in fact, I will invite every citizen whose rights have been oppressed, whether you are subject to unlawful arrest or unlawful seizure of property, that you are constitutionally entitled to resist it. Don't look at the fact that the individuals who are involved in that are police officers. In fact, our anti mandates us that those who are more likely to oppress us is those who we must resist. So for me, it makes no difference as to who is entitled to violate rights and who is supposed to be able to protect themselves. Protect yourself always, and I'll do that today. I mean, were you not worried about the consequences that could have... I mean, I am standing there in a public protest, which is a constitutional protest, where the presidents have made it clear that they were going to arrest us. And in fact, because of what happened last year, we know that when they arrest us, we're going to be subject to inhuman treatment. But we came out nonetheless. Because the bigger message, the health of our democracy is much mm -hmm. more important to me in that moment. And it will continue to be. Very well. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll look at other issues in the aftermath of the protests. Yeah. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My guest is Oliver Barker Vomawo. Oliver, when you were running away from the police, did you consider that you could have been injured or maybe even shot in the process? Um, I, I always say that I always count on the police to act unlawfully. I always expect the worst from them in terms of their conduct and whatever they do. But I think that for me, the bigger question to us is how much more can we allow and then even in every situation is a learning example for our democracy that this conversation around this, it would allow us to be able to illuminate better citizens' rights whenever we engage the police. Right. Now, if they had acted unlawfully to be in a series of other things they have done, even when I was in custody, they've done, they done things which were worse than what happened in that moment. Mm -hmm. So do I expect, could I have expected that they would have acted that way? I wouldn't have been surprised. But I would, have, I would not change my conduct even in the face of when persons try, threatens me with illegal violence. Mm, I see. Um, I, I want to talk about, well, you, well, perhaps even before we talk about that, um, let me ask, do you get off on being disobedient or this is real advocacy? I, I, don't, I don't see a difference between the two. You know, I don't see a difference between the two. I think the bigger question is that we have to understand that rights, historically, have been won by not saying, no, by saying no, mm -hmm. right? Like, as I've always been said, power consists nothing without demand. The demand is not that you come in and you knock on the door. Can you give me the right? And it's like, oh, yes, I have it here on the platter for you. There's consistently going to be saying, get out of our face. And you must hold the line. Mm -hmm. So on so many issues that have happened in this country, there's so many Ghanaians that tell us that there's no reason to protest. And the reason why they say that is not that our, our lives are so much better, mm -hmm. but because they're not going to say, nothing is going to change. Right. They're not going to listen to you. We have become so accustomed to the saying, to the norm of, of authorities that we have assumed that as our default position when we are engaging with them. But in that case, we have become, we have become beggars, right? We've become beggars for, for dignity. Like we are always consistently waiting for favor to be mm -hmm. things to be done. And so this refusal to say that, no, you must treat us as human. You must listen to us. That courage is what people are finding that, okay, perhaps this is fresh in our democracy. We've never seen this happen. Because the alternative is, even I, every time I step out to a protest, my family is constantly calling that, please be home. Why are you? Ghana will not change. Why are you worrying yourself? That is how we are raised culturally. Right. And then we turn around and still surprise that, but why is everything going not? Why is everything getting bad? Because when it matters for us to say, no, you can't treat us like that. You can't serve us poison water in search for good. This is where we draw the line. Right. We, are, we are told that that in itself, there's something wrong with it. And that's how, that, is, that is the courage of our convictions and principles we want to build. Then 54 of you were arrested yeah. you know, by the end of all of this. Um, you were put into jail. You wrote from jail complaining about the state of affairs uh, there. Talk to us about, you know, your experience, the treatment that was handed down to you while you were... You know, one of the, um, one of the biggest things that has been life-defining life mm -hmm. for me is advocacy around 
you know, jail conditions and prison conditions for individuals, Ghanaians who have been in those situations. As a young person in my early 20s, I was volunteering for the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. And I used to go to various police cells across the country. And they would, police officers would lock me up in there and I would sit there for hours interviewing the inmates about their rights mm -hmm. and how it's being respected and things like that. And I'll come out from those places drenched in sweat. So I'm familiar with the situation which people are done. Later on, I say humorously that those prepared me for later on when I would be locked up in, in, in line of our advocacy. But it's so, it, it, it eats at my soul to think that we call ourselves a civilized people, that we'll be able to lock humans in this situation, that there's no access to clean water, that people are packed in, when I say packed in, people sleep on their side. They, call, they, they have half a tile, is what they call it, where you, you lie down and you are packed as sardines. Those are slave-like conditions. And on top of it, we drop people there and we don't feed them. Like whether you can find food for yourself, whether your family that is coming over, we don't care. It seems to me inherently inhumane that we as a society would be okay with this. And so every opportunity I've gotten, this is something I've, I've talked about. The first time I was arrested, I complained about this. Right. To see people who were not being fed at the state and what was happening. When I came out, we organized donations for people in the cell. The police statement, police institution released a statement saying that I was only trying to cut public attention and that none of that is true and they feed inmates consistently. Mm -hmm. But every single day, inmates show up to our court and somebody will tell a judge, I haven't eaten in three days. Right. And it will be a laughter in the courtroom. And I've always wondered, what kind of people are we? And, and that is something you described as extreme inhumanity and national institutionalized starvation scheme. Yes. Then you encourage your inmates. It's not a question of encouragement. It's a question of having conversations with everybody as to how do you draw attention to this. And the suggestion was that, let's do a hunger strike. And so in that moment, for me, it was important and interesting to me that individuals who were there and every time, one of the things they say in, in the cells is that, me, I'm here only thinking about my case. That's what everybody says in there. To see a real moment of solidarity among those individuals and said, some things are bigger than me as an individual. And that we must pick up not only for ourselves, but for everybody else. Because tomorrow, somebody else will come into that. To see that happen before my eyes, I was deeply moved. Mm. So that resolution that people said, you know what, irrespective of the consequences, we want to do this. And in fact... One of the things that I have always been a big fan of hunger strikes, you know, as a, as a mechanism of protest. It's a, big, it's a big conversation between Gandhi and, and Mandela, between what Mandela doesn't believe in, it's Gandhi things. That process of self-deprivation to fight injustice is much more humane than saying that I'm going to meet violence with violence. Mm. But, I mean, you're already being starved. Yeah. Then you decided to go on a, so what a, happens in a the hunger cells? strike yes. as well. So what actually... You're seeing a real moment of solidarity between the haves and have-nots. There are individuals in this who are families who will bring them food. Right. They are telling their families that, no, I want to identify with other people who are starving in the cells. So that together, it's the real unity of that moment, I think throughout my stay in, in, in cells, there's nothing that has emotionally touched me to see that process happening before my, my very eyes. Mm. That these individuals are saying that, you guys understand that it's not about me. I'm constantly giving food. Even some of them are the ones who would pass on their leftovers for others to eat in mm. the cell. But this moment, I want to stand and let's stand together. After you made this known, did the police bring you food? Nothing changed. In fact, we saw them come, several of them, the high police officers, trying to uh, advise me to get out. The process, I hurry up with my bail to leave. Mm. That was their interest. It was never a conversation about... These are just issues. In fact, there are so many police officers that I know that come there, and sometimes they use their money to buy food for individuals. So the individual police officers, some of them, identify with the... They don't understand the inhumanity of it. Mm -hmm. Now, the, institutionally, at the highest level, it seems like this is something that we don't care about. In fact, we are disgraced by the fact we have done this. And they went on threatening the inmates consistently. Somebody says, I don't want to eat. So what's the point of a threat to them? In fact, they went on to say that well, they later issued a statement saying that I was jeopardizing or that I, they have picked up intelligence that I was trying to jeopardize the security of the inmates. I don't even know what that means. Mm. What they had told, when I was being moved, after the incident that happened, they had told the commander at the other place that I had radicalized the cell. What, is, what, what does it mean to radicalize? An individual was asking that. In fact, and, feed and that was me. why they said they were moving you yes. out of that. Yes. Somebody says, feed me. Somebody says, I'm drawing your attention to my conditions that I'm living in here. And you say that you are being radical. 
You see, that's why I'm always, I accept those labels. You're being disobedient and things like that. Because they are used in a way in which to, to, to create stigma around your just request for mm. to be treated with dignity. I see. You have described the police behavior as coming from a certain regime. When you say that, what do you mean? Well, the, 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 one, that we understand, you know, intellectually, because there's been a lot of intellectual work here, the way in which the police as an institution was formed. That the violent, the violent nature of colonial police is something that is known world over. That they were set up in a particular way. And those practices have not completely dissipated from, from there. Even though we've ushered ourselves into a democracy, the transitioning of those institutions into a democratic institution hasn't happened. No, I, I mean, I'm asking when you made reference to uh, the fact that there were orders from above, the police were intentionally, yeah. you know, putting, uh, you know, difficulties in the way of democracy, how protesters. Yeah. What did you mean when you said this, there appeared to be a regime? No, what I, I mean, I'm describing what we are witnessing uh, as a regime, oh, because right. I, right, I'm describing the regime that we are living under, those mm. we vote for and who have consolidated themselves into a, a class of people that we can't demand accountability for. While, while all 54 of you were in jail, conversations went on around the country, the conduct of the protesters became a, a focal point mm. for these conversations. Mm. Uh, when you heard behind bars how conversations were going, uh, outshining you know, the, the essence of why the protesters were there, mm. uh, you, know, uh, you know, for to protest uh, illegal and unethical mining. Yeah. Did it bother you that, you know, we were not talking about Galamsey, we were talking about the conduct I, I, I of think protesters. that one of the things in which when we want to be analytical, that the first day the protests happened without incident, the police kept issuing statement upon statement that were being violent. And when they do that, we show them pictures and we do video live, showing people uh, playing football. Everything, they were trying to condition the atmosphere to use the violence they did. And one of the things that happens in many protests, it happened even in, in Kumi Prekong, is that when violence is used in the manner in which they use it, it detracts the conversation from what the issue is. The protesters do not go out and say that we want to be violent towards you. We are very set on the, the conversation we want to have. But they understand that even when they have been brutal against protesters, when press cover it, they don't say protest, police beat protesters. They say police clash with protesters. There's a scaffold. Mm. So the language creates a sense of where that we are meeting them with violence. And that becomes the, the scope of the conversation. In fact, when you think about it critically, they had two videos on loop. The video of me taking the key, not attacking anybody. We are disabled. Yes, we are demobilized the vehicle. We own that with our chest. And then when they had some individuals lined up and pushing back at one person, they had those videos on loop consistently. You would not see 54 isolated incidents of people, they said what, assaulting police officers. Uh, I, I, I don't know, there's a litany of offenses that people have been charged with. They had that on loop because they had their own camera people. They're calling the police TV now. And their essence is that let's just churn out a sensational video as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and get people riled up. But we were certain that cooler heads will eventually prevail. And it did prevail. That at some point people said, wait a minute, this is, bigger, this is beyond what you're, you're claiming. Mm, but the police succeeded. We had politicians. I mean, of course they did. We know that the success of it is short term. The success of distraction is always going to be short term. But in the long run, that's why Bartolita King talks about the, the moral arc of the U.S. with long, but it always bends towards mm -hmm. justice. That eventually, that would happen. And it's, when that happened, we saw the beauty of it. We saw the Catholic Church speak up. We saw various civil society organizations issue statements criticizing the police conduct. We saw other people organize protests Indeed. demanding for free the citizens and Absolutely. also uh, drawing uh, back attention to the democracy. So it failed. I mean, and so particularly that when you were in jail and you saw people who were yeah. demanding your release yeah. uh, together with the 53 others, how did that make you feel? Well, I think for me, it's a verdict of the society generally as to whether or not we're believing the, the attempt to, how do you call it, to redirect the conversation or bring it back to the table. I think that is important that we are, I've always credited the Ghanaian with incredible intelligence and sense. And we saw that on display, that people recognized and saw through the BS, for lack of a better word. And I, I, for me, it, it is, it's a, how do you, how do you even say it? It, it? it repays my enduring faith in the Ghanaian spirit. Mm. That eventually, despite all the fear that people tell us every day that they, they harbor, that there will come a point where they will stand up for justice. And I've always bet my life on that. And when people tell me that, are you not tired? I am never tired in believing that the Ghanaian will show up. 
And I think that they did show up and it will continue to show up for young I people. See. I see. I'll piggyback off the question, are you not tired? Because this is not your first time no. in, 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 in any encounter with the police. No. Oliver, what do you want? Why do you do what you do? You know, um, I don't understand why our society has not been able to find a way to solve poverty. It's man-made. I don't understand why we as a society can watch our environment being pillaged to this level. And everybody will say to us, I'm only thinking of myself, I don't want to get involved. It doesn't seem right to me. The demand for dignity, we cannot be tired of that. For me, I, it, perhaps it's been a question of a difficulty adjusting because I spent most of my life, the greater part of my life I've spent outside of the country. And that I've seen that. I've seen even in societies we think are better, every day at Trafalgar Square, over 100,000 people show up to protest every single day. Even they that are treated better than we are. Even they who animal rights, even as our people say, that even animals have rights that are protected by those society. They continue to show up and demand more. It's, it's, I cannot seem to accept that I must live a life where my humanity and my dignity must be denied. That I must go to a prison where everybody doesn't eat. So, ah, okay, well, this is how it is done. That we must, well, the environment is destroyed, but everybody is afraid. We can't say anything, no. I, I, can't, I can't accept it. And no matter how people push me down and want me to accept that reality, it's never going to happen. It is, I'm never going to be okay with living the kind of life that we have been told to live. So that's the change I want to see in my society. And whether, whether it happens in my lifetime or it doesn't happen, I would not stop trying to see a better tomorrow. What would you call the life we live here? <sighs> I think everybody should describe it for themselves. I think every Ghanaian should look at themselves and wonder and say to themselves, is, 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 is this what I deserve? Is this what our founding fathers envisaged for us as a people? I think that conversation we need to have with ourselves. For me, the most depressing thing I've had to live with is waking up one day and seeing that, wait, this country is not going to change in my lifetime. You know, because we all grew up believing that tomorrow will be better, the vision 2020. We still have a hope of seeing a different Ghana. I've got, I got to a point where I realized that, no, it's not going to happen. And, and that realization, as depressing as it is, it moved me to demand, how am I going to ensure that tomorrow's generation have a different reality and engagement in society. Mm. That's my mission and core. Mm. And I think other young people who step out as well have realized the truth of that. And so we're not doing this because we believe that in our lifetime, true change that Ghanaian is deserving can fully happen. Oliver, we'll take another break. When we come back, we'll go into the details of the experiences you had while in jail. You talked about being beaten. Um, I, I want to learn more about that. Don't go away. Welcome back. This is still Hot Issues. I'm still here with Oliver Barker Vomawo. Oliver, um, while you were in, in custody, by the way, why were you, how were you writing all those, you know, tweets and posts from behind bars? Uh, <laughs> I do anticipate that in the long course of our, of our advocacy that I'm going to be arrested again. That let's, let's, let's not allow a revolutionary to reveal all their secrets. I can respect that. <laughs> I can respect that. But let's talk about one of those things you tweeted when you talked about being beaten. What happened to you? We saw your bloody uh, wrist. What happened to you? You know, um, one of the things that I'm still coming to terms with is that I understand that the, the police were going to be very discomforted by the fact that myself and other inmates were talking about the conditions under which people were being held. I understood that. And I was expecting that even in their embarrassment about mm -hmm. it, it will move the humanity in them to want to have a conversation about it and deal with that. What I didn't anticipate, even in terms of all the brutality I'm aware of, that their reaction to this would be violence. Then I know that, you know, for when people are weak-minded, that their response to a, even a genuine conversation is to use force. That's fair. On Saturday, which is, so the first day, perhaps on the Friday, they were still quite tentative about, is this really going to happen? To see it hold, you know, those inmates that their families brought food to them, returned the food away, said that, no, we are not having any food. 
or anything like that. To see it hold on the Friday, I think, gravely surprised them. So on Saturday, that's when they first started, they took one of the inmates out who they sent to in Sawam. You know, we're threatening right. the other people, we're going to disperse you and things mm -hmm. like that. So I was lying down reading, and that's what I spend most of my time in cell. I tend to wake up very early. Most people wake up around 12. Um, I wake up at 5 a.m. and start reading. So most people. So I was reading. Listen, I, uh, incidentally, in the police station, that's a, there's a TV that serves the police officers. If you come close to the cell gates, you can see it. So I was watching Key Point uh, that was going on here in, mm -hmm. in the morning. And so then, when they were in break, at some time, I went back and relaxed, started reading. And then, about six, roughly six to eight, I saw eight later, but I think six entered the cell, heavily armed, and then started shouting at everybody, go back. So they pushed everybody into a corner, right? And then they asked me to step out, so I isolated me. And so I stepped out of the cell, and I came, to, I came outside. Then the, one of them asked me, where are you, all your things? And so I said, I asked them, what's happening? Why are you taking them? Then he repeated, where are all your things? I said, I want to know what's happening. I don't know what happened next. One of them had my neck in a lock. The other one was forcibly trying to put a lock on me. The other one was stepping on my, on my feet with their boots. And then before I realized, punches were all over my face. In, this is within coming out of the cell and behind the police counter. There was no conversation at any point. We want to move your cell, go somewhere. So I, we anticipated that was going to happen. In fact, when the first person was being moved out in the morning to Insawam, the cell got together and started clapping for him. Mm. The cell started singing gospel songs when the person left. Right. So we anticipated this was going to happen. So when they came, where, where are you moving me? Is a question. Or why are you going... How many, how many police officers were involved in this? Now, there were, there were, I know that there were, there were eight of them who, were, who held me and started punching down on me mm. in that moment. But there were more as well because they had two separate vehicles as they were being transported to the other place. For just so were, you? For just me. So there were, there were several individuals. Now, think about it. This is not the first time I've been removed from the cells. I've, so many times I've been asked to come out. At no point, in fact, every time that somebody comes to the counter, tells the counter CEO, they tell me, they open up, I come out. At no point have they come, unlocked it, and come in there with force. In fact, they wanted the image to see the brutality of that encounter, I think, to be able to put the fear, the, the fear of God in them. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was deeply surprising to see that happen. I couldn't for the life of me understand. And this, all of this was supervised by the individual, the two IC of mm -hmm. the Accra nice. Regional Command. He was standing there. I see. Shout, and as this was going, he was shouting profanities at me throughout the incident. And why the, so the, 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 the process of doing that, and the intention obviously was to beat me up and do all of that. All of that happened. And they took, so then they, they ushered me out. I was in, I was in a boxes, and I was in a, a white top that I was wearing. That's all I had. There was no slippers, there was nothing. I was just bundled and thrown into a vehicle. I had no idea where I was being taken to. I had nothing. In fact, I didn't realize I was bleeding so much till later on halfway into the, into the journey, mm. you know? And in that moment, I kept asking myself, like, what to do? Because I was extremely agitated from what had happened to me. Right. I, I just kept wondering, like, what do I do? And, and, and even in my confusion, back. I didn't know where I was being sent to. Right. But I was still wondering, like, I was still, I was still processing it throughout. And I knew that we were driving off and off. I had no idea where I'd been taken to. Eventually, we ended up at uh, Dansuman. When we got there, I was, complete, I was completely bleeding into, into the water. You were drenched in your I was water. drenched in it. You know? In fact, uh, I know, I could, I could feel that, that this hand, there was a problem because I couldn't move it as right. much. You know? And the, it was, the blood was still coming, even as we were sitting there. So when they came to there, they spoke to the officers. They were going to throw me into the cell. In fact, they put me in the cell. In there, and I was in there for a while. And then they, they, they came back. Because I had asked, for, I'd asked the commanding officer there that I wanted a broom. Because it was extremely dirty. If I can get a broom to sweep. So he, he brought somebody that the person should sweep the cell. And I told the person, no, I'd rather do it myself. Because I don't want to burden anybody. So I started it. And then they... They asked me to come out of the cell and they brought me to come and sit down again. So as I was sitting there, 
then the, the, the two I see who are supervising this starts again with the insults, right? So one of them went to one of the other command, I think it was one Mr. Nafiu, I can't be sure, then mentioned that let us at least take him to the hospital because he's bleeding. So that's what they decided in that moment. Yeah. I was surprised that they even they did that because right. I know that the Einstein was to avoid and that perhaps they themselves were acting in a manner which they were hoping that physical scars would not show. Mm. So the bleeding kind of disconcerted them a bit. Police explanation for what happened was that she sustained injuries in transit. <laughs> I don't know how. But I don't know what that means, to be honest. And in fact, I've, I've reserved a lot of comments about that because mm. for me, there's so many things that I'm still trying to make sense of. Would you consider that an honest representation of what happened to you? That what? You sustained the injuries in transit. How? In the air? I, I don't know how, but I mean, I know that the statement is deliberately crafted in a way, using passive or whatever language as if injuries descended upon you as in the way in which manner descends upon a person. But I'm telling you what happened, mm -hmm. that they did this. I know that in that moment when I was bleeding, that it confused them a bit. Because I was surprised that they, they themselves had a conversation to take me to the hospital, mm -hmm. which saw to it that I was treated, bandaged, tetanus was given to me in those moments. Uh, before sent back to the cell. In fact, since I've been out and they released this statement, right. we, I, I sent someone to, this is called, I think it's called the Opokuwari Hospital in Dansuman, to go from, for, the, for the medical report that the, the attending physician did. Mm -hmm. And the physician said that he had received calls threatening him from the police and that he was afraid to release the, the medical statement. I see. And that the police had told him that if I want it, I should come and see them and they will come with me to come for the statement. Have you seen your medical reports? No, I haven't. But what we had a report of is that the blood stain shed that they wanted to take away from me and I resisted, that we eventually passed that out to persons who had come subsequently. That incidentally, I don't know who took the picture of when I was being returned back but some people who, because some people, I'm sure people had lined up on the street, took a picture of the incident. And that's how that picture even came into the public domain. Hmm. So I'm sure they were surprised by the picture camera, which allowed them to fess up. And in fact, it's the first time I'm seeing the police admit that an inmate sustained injuries, uh, in, which is at their hands. Yeah, while you were being transferred <laughs> from one station uh, to the other. They didn't say they caused the injuries ah. in that statement. So uh, perhaps in, in the future, we'll get to the bottom of this. But we've got ahead. This is a conversation that. I, I think that we are, we are clear in our minds that if we want young people not to lose faith in this democracy, we can't sweep this under the carpet. Mm. This happened last year. We are in court still suing them over it. But this conversation merits a national conversation. And we are demanding and we're going to petition majority in parliament right. to take this issue up. Because we can't allow this when, to when go do you, again. When do you plan to do that? We, within the course of next week. Within the course of next week. But speaking of democracy... Listen, we've said a lot of things that are wrong with our country at the moment. Mm. Is there hope for our democracy to serve us? You know, one of the things that... Um, um, one of the things I was reading a lot, I really enjoy philosophy. And one of them, Edmund Burke, said something which is that a state that lacks the means to change, lacks the means for its own conservation. To sustain our democracy, mm. we ought to be committed to the process of en enhancing it, of changing ways that do not align with that democratic culture. Uh, Professor Kwesi Prempe talks about that. We are trying to build a democracy without Democrats. It can't happen. You know, it's almost as if you're a, a person living with schizophrenia. That per we, are, we are professing that we want to be a democracy, but our conduct and our actions do not reflect it. We must reconcile that. And I think the biggest thing that would ensure that the democracy sustains itself is the people's belief in it. And the people seeing that it can, in fact, answer our most daring questions. Our questions around poverty, our questions around um, health care, around the environment. Democracy must answer those questions for those people in order to, for them to believe in that. We believe that all that we have done, we have done more to sustain our democracy than anything that is, mm. even if they don't give us the credit for. Right. Because every time young people come out for a protest, they say to us that I was so angry when I was coming to that protest. But when I left, I felt that we had done something. Mm. It's a cathartic experience to, to show up for a protest, to be able to release that pent-up anger. We cannot allow it to be redirected. And if they don't understand the work we are doing to sustain our democracy, we are aware of what it takes and what we are doing in the process. Oliver, is this all worth it? 
Is it worth the pain you go through? Do you think that Christ's death was worth it? There's so, there's so much uh, sin that continues to happen many years after Christ died. But I don't think, I, I don't doubt for a fact or a second the value of that sacrifice. And I don't think that any society has changed without that process of sacrifice. Um, I'm not counting the cost to myself. Those are individual costs. We're not going to count that. But we will always be reminded of the promise, what it would mean for others, what's the benefit they are going to derive. It's absolutely worth it. Mm. I, the, the idea that Ghana is not worth dying for, I think it's absolutely ri ridiculous. We are all worth it. We are all worth living a different and a better life. And if this is the path towards it, we must take it. I believe in that sincerity. And so that's why I don't measure my advocacy in terms of elections or party or who is that. Because Ghanaians don't measure what's happening to them in terms of every four-year term. We are living that reality every day. And so we, I, I'm completely disabused about what the politics does or who is voting for who. I just know that this is not where I want this country to be. Mm. This is what every other Ghanaian tells me. And every Ghanaian other tells me that we want to be doing what we are doing, right. but we are afraid of. Hopefully we break that pattern of fear mm. before it's too late. You initially was, you were denied bail. Mm. Uh, because you had two other cases pending, and that was the reason the judge gave for denying your bail. Yeah. I want to talk about those cases. Okay. Your treason charge, yeah. which you have consistently written about, not starting. Yeah. What's going on there? I, I, I don't know how many you know, press interviews I have given. In fact, our lawyers have gone to the Supreme Every time we need them to file a process, it can go for three months. Unless we go and file something at the Supreme Court mm -hmm. to discontinue the trial, then they come and file one process. It has been consistently the strategy of the regime to use this to, de to, to, to draw me back in advocacy. And I'm very clear that I know what you intend with it. I'm not going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't surprised. I mean, I'm a lawyer myself. I knew that they were hoping for a moment like this. It was the golden uh, egg that they were hoping for. But anybody who knows me knows that. If you come to my any of my platform every other day, I am complaining that why is the state not prosecuting me? Every single time. The last time we were in court, that is Monday, right. they just said they saw no way in which the trial can start before the year ends. So essentially, Akufuado has achieved what he's intended to, which is that he's not going to, to do this, this prosecution, but he's going to encumber me for the rest of his term. Mm. He has achieved it because the trial is not going to start. The judge made it clear this year. I mean, do you see the same happening with the case between you and... The 54, the, that is the pending... No, no, the National Security Minister. In, incidentally, that the, the, the last time we were in court, uh, the judge struck out our defense and our counterclaims against him because I was supposed to have filed a witness statement which coincided with the, the, the period I was being held in mm -hmm. jail. And so the judge is saying that, well, I don't care that you were in jail. You still, still have filed it. And for which reason? We have canceled, we have thrown out your defense. Mm. So we are only going to take his case. What does that mean? Essentially, it means that he has made allegations against me and there's no defense on record because they struck it out. And so if there's no defense to the statement he's made, then it means that he wins. But we are going to challenge that. We are going to reapply to realize the defense. We are going to provide those witness statements. And they can do it with whatever they, they want to do it. One but of, one of the things that is clear to mm -hmm. us, I don't think that they are going to stop. Even as we're getting closer to the election, I don't for one second think. I see them, the, the surveillance that they are mounting on me. I see them all over me. I see them even the, before I went to sell, uh, I was wearing a T-shirt which had uh, an institution, a civil mm -hmm. society institution in the country that... National security people are circling that building, thinking they have any affiliation with it. I see. That's the life I've lived for the past two years, consistently being harassed. It's not going to change. I mean, but I want to make it clear, I am not going to stop. So I, I, don't, I don't care what you're going to do, but I'm making it clear to you. I am not going to stop in our demand for a better democracy. It's not going to stop. So that's what I anticipate is going to happen. The cases are not going anywhere, we are being told. As long as, uh, till the, well, till, till the elections... And maybe when they win the elections, they're going to renew the, they're going to continue to renew the vigor. I don't know. Mm. But one of the things that I'm clear on, I am not going to be pushed into exile. I'm not going to run away. I'm going to be here. And you can do all you do, but no matter what, even if it's to go to prison, no matter what it takes, I'll come out. Mm. No matter what it takes, I will continue advocacy. Mm. I see. 
You wrote on October 21st on X that the state of our justice system is even worse than what Galamse has done to our environment. Without going into that statement, I want to understand from you whether you think that, listen, this current administration could do something spectacular to put this country on the right path before they wrap up. Well, I'm still holding out hope. When the president says that he's putting his presidency on the line for Galamse, for instance, that he would resign from office. He still uh, has a few months. I'm still, I, I'm still consistently hopeful that they'll be struck. Resign? Yes. That he then will show Ghanaians that I put my presidency on the line and I failed to do that. Sometimes there are sparks of these things in our democracy, as bad as it is, that you had, I think his name was Kobna Donko, who was minister for power, mm -hmm. who said if you don't get the electricity by December, he was going to resign. He did resign. Now, the presidency claimed that he's put his presidency on the line. I don't know him to be a man of honor, but I can be surprised, and I allow Rumo always to be surprised. So that if he is compelled by his own words, hopefully he does that. It might give the people a sense that, hey, when leaders promise something and they fail at it, they give us an indication that they, they are people whose words matter to them. That in itself is a lesson that they can teach our democracy, no matter how much minute. It might give us the hope that, in fact, when they misbehave, we can demand accountability and we can achieve something. That is the best gift I think you can give to this democracy. Oliver, thank you for coming. I appreciate you as well. Oliver Barker Vomawa has been my guest on Hot Issues. If you missed this, watch it again on Facebook and on YouTube. I'm Kemeni Amano. I'll see you same time next week. Bye-bye.